Today, we're taking a look at a really fascinating game that Garry Kasparov played in a simultaneous exhibition back in 1991. His opponent was Gabriel Bavagnoli, and he has a peak FIDE rating of about 1950. Gary is playing with the white pieces, and he opens with 1d4, knight of 6, c4, and c5, striking out the white center and taking the game in the direction of either a Bononi or a Benko. We have d5 from Kasparov and b5. This is the start of the Benko Gambit, which has terrorized so many club players, including myself at times. An absolutely horrific opening to face if you don't know what you're doing from the white side. Gary takes the pawn on b5 and black plays a6. So this is the point of the Benko Gambit. Black is inviting white to continue snacking on the queen side. If white were to, to take that pawn, essentially black is getting white's C pawn in exchange for his own A and B pawn. In return for giving up this pawn, he's actually opening up these lines on the queen side. And his idea is that he'd like to quickly castle, get both of his rooks and all of his pieces basically lined up and pressuring that queen side. And it turns out that in a practical game, diffusing that pressure from the perspective of the white player is actually quite challenging. So that's the idea behind the Benko Gambit. And in this position here, Gary actually plays a really rare move. He plays F3. And it's a move that I personally really love playing against the Benko Gambit. There are no subtleties to this plan from, from white. He's playing F3 with the idea of just taking control of the center of the board with e4. And it's actually the fourth most common move that white plays. So if you're looking to catch your opponent by surprise in the Benko, I do really like this approach of, of going with f3 for a quick e4. So it's a great system for white. In the game, black plays g6, looking to quickly set up his typical Benko style development. But let's have a look at what happens if black instead just takes that pawn, a takes b5, instead of rushing forward with his kingside development. Well, as white here, we simply play e4, just taking control of the center of the board. Black throws in this check. We intercept it with the bishop, hitting the queen. And now black's idea in this variation is that he push forward with b4. And his idea is to play d6 and get a nice chain going on the on the queen side but here we play this cute little move knight to a3 taking advantage of the b pawn being pinned the knight cannot be captured and he's looking to set up a bind on the light squares which is a very common theme and we'll, we'll see that in in today's game actually okay so after f3 black instead played g6 and e4 from kasparov so as intended, taking over the, the center of the board, d6. And in this position, I just wanted to quickly mention that the immediate bishop to g7 here would allow white to play e5 and the black knight would be a bit embarrassed. It would be forced back to g8. So that is why in this position, instead of rushing with bishop to g7, black is throwing in d6 first, just to make sure that there's no funny business happening with e5. And now we have Knights to a3 from Kasparov. The Benko Gambit is definitely one of those openings where if you play automatic, natural looking moves, you can very quickly find yourself in a really difficult position actually. It's an opening where you really need to know the best place for your pieces to go. And in this game, actually, Gary shows us. This move, Knight to a3, is more about the Knight on g1. So you might ask yourself, well, how is that possible? How is this knight to a3 move more about the g1 knight? Well, the Benko for white is really about taking control of these light squares on the queen side. It's all about that light square control there. Eventually, white wants to play his own initiative in the center of the board or on the king side. But first, he needs to take control of the situation on the queen side. And that is done by dominating the light squares and blockading them on the queen side. How does knight a3 help with that? Well, white would like to get his kingside knight actually onto c3, where from c3, it would be guarding a4 and b5. But the issue is 
if we go back to this position here, if we play the immediate knight to e2, black can just take our pawn because our bishop is no longer guarding it. And it turns out that this position is actually quite good for black because white has just given up his c pawn for the black a pawn. So that's, that's not really a good trade for white. So we want to avoid this. So instead, we bring the knight to a3 first. So now we'd like to play knight to e2 next and bring that knight across to c3. And black cannot take our pawn on b5 in that situation because the knight on a3 is guarding it. So we see bishop to g7. And now, as explained, we have knight to e2, black castles, and knight to c3. And now we can see so many white pieces have such a strong grip on these light squares. Have a look at this. This knight on a3, nicely controlling some light squares. The knight on c3, controlling some nice light squares. And the bishop on f1 actually is, is quite important here as well. So very harmonious setup here of the light square blockade on the queen side. Black takes on b5. And he's also threatening to advance that pawn in this position and, and fork the knights. So that forces Kasparov to retake that pawn. And he does so with his knight that was on a3. Bishop to d7, putting some pressure on that knight. And a4, so further reinforcing his grip on the light squares. Knight to a6 and bishop to c4. And this move is actually quite important. It might not seem obvious at first why. Back here, why not simply play something like bishop to e2 or bishop to d3? Why bishop to c4? What is so special about that move? Well, with the bishop on c4, it's actually preventing black from playing c4 himself. Potentially in some situations, black might want to jettison that pawn to gain access to the c5 square with some of his pieces, or to potentially open up some dangerous diagonals. Having that bishop on c4 actually blocks the black pawn in place, preventing black from playing c4 himself, but also the bishop might potentially play an active role if white were to get his kingside attack going. We can imagine that in some situations, that advanced pawn on d5 might suddenly become mobilized and the white bishop on c4 would suddenly be unleashed. So in this particular variation, the bishop often finds itself on c4. And now we have knight to b4 from black, which is probably where things really start to go wrong for him. It looks like a really nice and tempting move. What could be so bad about putting your knight on an outpost like this? Well, we'll let Gary Kasparov show us, but let's take a quick look at the computer recommendation. So instead of knight to b4, the computer wanted to play knight to c7. I won't go into too much detail on this one because it's deviating from the game, but the computer really just wanted to exchange pieces on b5 and, and alleviate the pressure that white has with his space advantage. We all know that playing against a space advantage, you really want to exchange pieces. So the computer really wanted to just drop the knight back to c7 and start exchanging and then dropping this knight back to e8, routing it to c7 and exchange further. So that was the, the computer's approach to the position. But in the game, we have knight to b4, a natural human looking move. And we have castles from Kasparov, knight to e8. This is a pretty typical setup from black in the Benko. He is unleashing his monster dark square bishop with this knight move. And he's looking to get his knight across to the queen side as his idea in the Benko is that the action is going to be on the queen side. So let's let's reroute our pieces there and, and get involved in the action. Bishop to e3, knight to c7, and queen to d2. So Kasparov is playing a very simple strategy here. We know that in the Benko, the dark squared bishop for black is an absolute powerhouse. Look at how powerful this piece is. So Kasparov just simply wants to get his bishop onto h6 and exchange that off. We have an exchange of knights. Gary retakes with his knight. And now we have rook to e8 and f4. So finally, Kasparov now has a firm grip on those light squares on the queen side. So he has black's initiative or intentions on the queen side under control. He has all of his pieces developed. His rooks are nice and active. His king is quite safe. 
now is the time to start launching our own initiative as white in the center of the board and on the king side. So F4 from Gary, starting to take the game down some aggressive paths. Queen to B8 and F5 just continuing to push forward with his initiative, not wasting any time. The pieces are well placed, so why wait? Let's just strike now. And knight to a6 from black. So he's desperately looking to exchange these pieces. His idea is to drop back to c7 and start exchanging some of these blockading pieces on the queen side because black's initiative in the Benko is all about the queen side, but white's light squared grip at the moment is just completely clogging that up. He can't do anything. So he's just gonna to try to exchange pieces off. That's, that's black's idea here. Bishop to h6. And so can you believe that? We are now only 19 moves into the game. Both sides have played some really natural looking moves. And in this position, believe it or not, according to the engine, white has an advantage of 3.18, unbelievable. And Kasparov is about to demonstrate to us why that number is so large. Knight to c7, he simply exchanges that important dark squared bishop, which is also protecting the black king. And that will be an important detail in the position actually. Black retakes the bishop and here Kasparov plays knight to c3. Now, I just wanna go back because in this position here, the computer gives this really interesting move. It wants to play the immediate f6. And the idea of this move f6 is that after black takes that pawn, the e7 pawn was actually needed to guard d6. So now with that pawn missing, we can now simply crash through with our knight. And now let's say for example, the rook moves to e5 to kind of clog things up in the center of the board because it, it was under attack by the knight. In this position, white simply has the completely crushing queen to f4. And we've got some unbearable pressure on f6 here. We are simply threatening to crash through with the queen and continue to just storm our way up the board. So let's say for example that black plays queen to d8 with the simple idea that he's looking to guard f6 to prevent white from just simply crashing through. We can actually take on f7, absolutely unbelievable. And the idea here is that if black takes that knight, we take the rook because the f6 pawn is pinned. It cannot capture the queen because it's pinned against the, the king. And in this position, actually, black is completely toast. There is a really, really devastating threat in this position, actually. Can you spot what that threat is? If it was white to move in this position, actually, we take that knight on c7 with our queen. And the idea is then that we play d6 check with the bishop checking the king, and then we'd recollect the queen as well. And that would be lights out for black. So a really, really fascinating uh, variation of possibilities if we saw the immediate f6 in that position, but instead we have knight to c3. And don't worry, the game is going to get really, really crazy. Okay, so knight c3, queen to b4, hitting the loose bishop on c4. We have b3, simply protecting the bishop, and f6. So black sees that there is a huge amount of danger from the idea of white playing f6 himself. So black plays f6 to prevent white from playing that move. Queen to e3. And so the idea of that move is if we just go back to this position here, the black queen was actually x-raying the white queen, which meant that the knight here is pinned. So the knight can't move and reroute itself towards the black king because that would simply hang the queen. So we move the queen to e3 to free up the knight. And now black plays this mysterious looking rook to h8. And his idea is that he wants to get his bishop rerouted to f7 because if we go back to this position here, the, the black king is looking very lonely there. And we can very quickly see that some lines must, might start to get opened up on the king side and having that black king all alone there is probably not gonna be the, the greatest outcome for, for black. So he's looking to increase his king safety and get his pieces rerouted. Kasparov plays rook to d1, centralizing his rook. And 
we can now see that all of Kasparov's pieces are just gloriously placed. They are really just waiting to pounce on this position. Black plays bishop to e8. As mentioned before, he's looking to get his bishop across to f7 to help with the defense of the king side. And now the position is just ripe. All of the pieces are just actively placed. Have a look at this. The rooks are glorious. Everything is just ripe. So Kasparov is not a person who waits around in chess. He strikes when the iron is hot. E5. Unbelievable. Have a look at this. Pushing his pawn to a square that is seemingly very well covered. So what's his idea? In the game, black played bishop to f7, but let's quickly take a look and see what happens if either of these pawns captures on e5, because we have some really fascinating variations for, for both of those actually. So what happens if he takes with the, the d pawn, d takes e5, would play d6, striking that knight? Now notice that that knight doesn't really have many places to go. It's only uh, available square is, is a6 actually, and that would be very sad. So let's say black takes that pawn. We'd play rook to d6, crashing through. And here white is threatening to take on g6 and open up a devastating attack on, on f6. So let's say black tries to play rook to a6 to try to exchange off that active rook of whites. Now, even though in this position, the white bishop is guarding that square, we can simply take that rook. And after black retakes, we play knight to d5. And this position here, even though it didn't happen in the game, it's one of my favorite positions from analyzing this game. Because at this stage, material is completely equal. Both sides have two minor pieces. They have a rook and a queen each, and we have the same number of pawns. So material is completely equal. Can you believe that in this position here, after the knight has jumped into d5, we're hitting the queen, the top three engine moves for black are not to save the black queen. Can you believe that? The computer doesn't even want to save the queen. That's how bad the position is for for black here. So let's say, for example, black plays a human move to try to protect the queen. Let's say we drop the queen back to b7. Have a look at the, the evaluation here. Plus 48. Unbelievable. That's like your, your advantage is over nine rooks plus 48. So the idea is that actually we can take on f6, which is absolutely stunning. And the idea is that after black recaptures on f6, we get our rook into the game by taking on g6 with check. And we are simply just crashing through and giving a checkmate. Have a look at this now. Notice that if the king goes to c6, we'd simply pick up the queen. So let's say we try c7, but then we come through with our queen and this is a checkmate. So the king very quickly gets hunted down in, in that variation. So an absolutely incredible situation if the D pawn were to take on E5. So what happens if the F pawn takes on E5? Well, we still have some really fascinating things here. Have a look at this. We play this quiet but deadly queen to G5. E7 is very tender. We are threatening to come in here and infiltrate. The knight on C7 is loose and there's no way that you can actually guard that point. You can't get the king to defend that point because we can very easily open up the F file at any moment. So that would be completely devastating. The only real defensive try here is rook to F8, looking to meet queen to E7 with rook F7. But we don't even pick up the pawn here. We play knight to E4, absolutely unreal. And let's say black tries rook to f7 to guard the seven franc. We simply play f6 check and we are simply just crashing through here. Have a look at this. We just snap that defensive rook off the board. We come in with our queen with check and have a look at this. We crash through with our knights. We are threatening to pick up the bishop. 
And let's say, for example, that black tries to guard his bishop with the rook and also hitting the queen as well. Well, this is absolutely lights out for, for black because we simply take that knight and after black retakes, the c4 bishop now is coming to life. We play d6 check. This is absolutely crushing. The only thing that black has to do here is to sacrifice his queen. So some really fascinating variations here. If either of those pawns were to take on e5, instead in the game, black plays bishop to f7 and Kasparov now takes on f6 with check. Black recaptures. And now he takes on g6. So he's got his f1 rook into the game, which is a motive that we saw in some of those other variations. Black recaptures with the bishop. And now we have queen to e7 check, infiltrating with the queen. So we've got a double attack against the king and the loose knight on c7. Not only that though, when the king scoots off to h6, notice that we can't pick up the knight immediately because our knight on c3 is hanging. So Kasparov plays the absolutely clinical and crushing rook to f3. And in this position, actually black resigned, which is completely understandable. Once again, have a look at the engine evaluation plus 46 here, but really we've got a very simple uh, mating sequence coming up. Let's say for example, knight to e8 to try to save the, the loose knight. We simply give the check on h3 and now regardless of what black does, it's a simple mating sequence. Let's say if black tries to intercept with the bishop. There's a really cute move here that puts the game to rest. It is queen to f7, taking advantage of the pin of the bishop against the king. And we are simply threatening now to just crash through with the rook. And that's actually a checkmate threat. So the only thing that black can do is just run away, but we simply hunt that king down very quickly. And likewise, instead of intercepting with the bishop, if the black king just simply tries to run away, we can just very quickly start hunting it down. And that is a very quick checkmate. Okay, well, thank you everyone for staying through to the end of the video. Absolutely fascinating game here from Kasparov in an unusual but very, very powerful and potent setup of playing f3 with a quick e4 against the Benko Gambit. Thank you for watching.